Hi, I'm joined by Mike Elliott, who is a technology director for Mercedes-AMG Petronas Formula One team. Uh, Mike, great of you to join me here today. I wanted to take this opportunity to ask you a few questions to help you simplify uh, some of, of the main things that we hear spoken about a lot in Formula One. Right. And, um, <laughs> So you're, you're now technology director, you're, you're um, historically an aerodynamicist. Could you just start by telling us what is downforce? Probably lots of explanations you could give. I guess in its simplest terms, the fact that the car is moving through air means that it's subjected to aerodynamic forces. And like an aircraft generates lift to fly, in a Formula One car what we're trying to do is to push it into the ground to generate downforce. So effectively, the wings on an aircraft we have, but we have them upside down. We use that to push that car down into the ground. So you talk about pushing. So, so I imagine for myself, if you've got, say, that's sort of the rear wing shape very roughly and there's air running across it, I imagine then that the, the force of that, that air, that wind, if you like, is pushing the back of the car down. Is, is that right? Or Because or, I've heard there are some common misconceptions about uh, that. There, there are some common misconceptions. I think if you look at the pressure distribution over a wing, um, I'll explain this in the right way. There's a, what we call dynamic pressure. So that's the, the pressure if you stop the air. So if you've got a certain amount of airflow traveling, if you stop the air, that's, that's the pressure you'd have. Um, so the most that can generate is a pressure coefficient of one. Whereas on the suction side of the wing, so the lower surface for us or the upper surface of an aircraft wing, we can see much, much higher levels of suction. Um, in fact, on parts of the car, it can be as low as sort of minus six. So it's the suction side that does the majority of the work. So the lower side of the wings in terms of a Formula One car. And in terms of the way we're pushing the car to the ground, what we're trying to do is create a balanced amount of force. Because we want grip in the front tires and we want grip in the rear tires. So actually we try and balance the car so the downforce is reasonably distributed across the front and the rear axle. Okay, so that starts to lead into what is, is my next question which is about why is it so important in Formula One to generate downforce? Because it wasn't always, was it? There weren't wings on the cars until the late 60s. Well, I think that's because people didn't understand that that's something you could do. Like, like most things that we think are obvious now, until somebody thought of that idea, it's not obvious. In terms of the way a tyre generates grip, the more we can push that tyre into the ground, the more grip we can generate, whether that's grip to push the car forward through the traction of the wheels from the power from the power unit, or whether that's the grip required to go around a corner to generate lateral loads. What we're trying to do is to push that car down. Now, if we did that with weight, we'd create more grip, but we've also got more weight to accelerate through power, and we've got more weight to accelerate as we corner. Um, and so if we add weight, we lose out in net, because the, the weight term in terms of the lateral load we've got to generate outweigh the grip that we get. If we do that through downforce, and we push the tyres into the ground, we get the same increase in grip, but now we've not got this added mass that we've got to accelerate around the corners or accelerate in a straight line when we, when we accelerate through the power unit. So it's a very effective way of increasing the grip levels and going around the corners much faster. In that respect, where is, is downforce most important? I, I would imagine it's in the high speed corners. You can, I'm assuming you can make up a lot of time if you've got downforce going around a high speed corner. Is, is that correct? Uh, no, in fact, actually, Probably the biggest effect is in the lower speed corners. So the amount of downforce we've got goes up with speed, which is quite, quite rightly what you were thinking. But actually the time we lose as we go around the circuit, most of the time we're losing is in the low speed corners because you just spend so much time there. You've got these two competing factors. On the one hand, you've got the amount of downforce you can generate through speed. And on the other hand, you've got the amount of time you're losing in that particular corner. So generally it's sort of the, the low to medium speed corners where downforce has the most effect on lap time. And some of that's to do with the nature of the circuits we're driving as well. I understand now that cars, they're generating more than their own weight in downforce. That's correct, right? Oh, a lot more than their own weight, depending on the speed. So then theoretically, this is a question that's been asked many times, but I, I want to ask someone can. in the know directly. Therefore, can a Formula One car drive on the ceiling of a tunnel? So the, the answer is yes. Um, the actual, to work it out is actually slightly more complicated than you think. So you've got to work out how much downforce you'd need to hold the car against its weight. And then you also need to work out how much extra downforce you need to apply the traction through the wheels to overcome the drag. Um, so it turns out, I think roughly speaking, I'm trying to do the calculations off the top of my head, I think about 150 kilometers an hour could roughly travel along the ceiling in terms of just the downforce, and then we need a chunk more to overcome the drag. 
Um, the question is, do you want to try it? Uh, the answer is definitely no. Too risky. I, I've got the feeling there will be at least a couple of drivers that are willing to try it <laughs> if we can make it happen. Yeah, just not one of our race drivers, please. <laughs> sure. So what you're saying is at far below half the capable speed of a Formula One car, they can theoretically drive on the ceiling of a tunnel if you could find someone who would want to do it. Someone daft to do it, yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I, funny enough, I used to use this as an interview question and you'd, you'd go through this with the engineers and they'd work out the weight and then you'd remind them they needed to account for the drag and they'd put that in. And then the last question you ask them is, so would you do it? And they go, well, yeah. And they're like, really? And it was just to see how they have this sort of practical, sensible mindset to um, realise that no, it's, not, it's a crazy thing to do. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of risk involved, surely. Yeah, you, you wouldn't want a... a to suddenly run out of power for whatever reason or find that you didn't pick up fuel properly when the car's upside down or the, the gearbox didn't lubricate or the engine didn't lubricate properly when it's upside down. Yeah, not the right time to find out. I, I understand all that, but I'm just really glad you said yes, it's possible. To me, <laughs> that's all that matters. Uh, that's the question. Um, you mentioned something else throughout that. You, you talked about the, the drag of the car. That's something that we hear commentators talking about. And of course, we hear aerodynamicists talking about when we're watching F1 on TV. Can you explain exactly what drag is, please, in the simplest terms? So drag's made up of a couple of parts. So the part which is just physically pushing the car through the air, so there's some resistances that come from that. There's also a part that comes from creating downforce. So if, we, if we're trying to create downforce, we have to turn the flow. And in turning the flow, you're changing the direction the air is going, and therefore there's a, the pressure force that comes from that. So actually, on a Formula One car, the majority of the drag is actually what's called induced drag, and that comes from generating downforce. Now, I've heard that a Formula One car has more drag than Usain Bolt, the 100-metre sprinter, and it has more drag than the Empire State Building. Um, is that true? Do you know that to be true? And also, how does an F1 car's drag relate to that of a standard road car? Okay, I've never been asked those questions before. I think because a, a Formula One car generates so much downforce, it almost certainly has more drag than both Usain Bolt and the Empire State Building. Um, corrected for area, of course. Um, in terms of a road car, road cars' drag is actually quite low, and uh, a Formula One car's drag is very high, both because it's generating downforce, but also, even if you just looked at the tyres alone, because the tyres are exposed to the airflow, the drag that they create would probably be more than a road car would, just the tyres alone. Just the tyres alone? create more drag than a road car. Yeah. Okay. Because the road car is streamlined and the tires are not streamlined. They're not designed to be. If you made them streamlined, they don't rotate very well. Sure. Okay, yeah, you, you've just effectively got air hitting a wall of rubber that's spinning at an incredible speed. Yeah, and so what happens is um, the air that hits the front of the tire is dragged down to the contact patch and it creates this sort of very lossy vortex system that comes from there. And that takes quite a bit of energy. So in that respect, how do we make that trade-off between downforce and drag? You, you said drag is a natural product of downforce, and then also we've got to manage the drag of the tyres and try and mitigate that as best we can. How ultimately do you make that trade-off? Because obviously you've been quite successful at it uh, for the last few years. When you hear people talk on, on television about Formula 1, they talk a lot about downforce. Um, there is an analysis we talk mainly about efficiency. So what we're trying to do is to extract the most downforce we can for a given amount of drag. Um, so while you have to generate drag to generate downforce, you can do that in more efficient ways. So when we are working in the tunnel, we, we, we're targeting an efficiency. And that efficiency is coming from our simulations. So our simulations tell us for each circuit that we go to, for every bit of downforce we add, how much drag can we add to stay at, stay at the same speed? Um, we obviously need to be providing downforce at a ratio that's better than that. And so we look at um, the average circuits, work out what that efficiency ratio needs to be, and then we make sure in the wind tunnel that we are adding on downforce at a better rate than that. Uh, that's a, that's a, sounds like a very long process. I think it's a process that's, that's well established. So I think the, the guys in, in Lowick's group in the performance areas, they'll do those simulations as a matter of course. And it's not just in terms of aerodynamics. We do that for everything um, that we're doing. We have efficiency targets for the power unit, for instance, in terms of how much power we need to, to produce for a given level of cooling. We have targets for weight efficiency. All of these things come from simulation. 
So having those for aerodynamics is just part of what comes out, and then the aerodynamicists are then able to make use of that information. Clearly a lot of complexity, and we've seen uh, F1 car designs get more and more complex over the years and generating huge amounts of downforce, like we've said. But sometimes we see in a race, of course the cars have these lots of tiny tips and flicks and sort of um, elements of the car are manufactured down to fractions of a millimetre, yet all of a sudden there's a slight bump with another car. We lose a, a chunk of something, but are still managing to put in impressive lap times. What does that mean? Does it mean that that part didn't need to be there? So when we're developing the car, we're, we're trying to find about a tenth of a second per lap, um, a race. It's not quite that much at the moment because the rules are fairly stable. That's the sort of amount you're trying to find. So, you know, a good upgrade package on the car with lots of bits is two or three tenths. When we break some of these bits, we wouldn't want to break them because of their performance, but they're not enough that it's easy to see within the sort of variance you're seeing anyway around the circuit. And in terms of what the drivers are feeling, that the drivers not only want downforce, but they want the car to be balanced. They want it to feel consistent and they want it to, to be predictable. They want it to have a balance of downforce across the car that means that when the grip runs out the front, it, it's nearly running out at the rear. So because of that, quite often what the drivers feel when these things break is more the balance change than the, the downforce change. And the car is unsettled and it feels different to them and therefore it's, it's hard to drive. Okay, that brings me to an example in Mexico last year. Uh, Lewis lost the rear right portion of his floor just before the rear right wheel uh, yeah. and said that that, have, that affected the, the car's balance and, and performance uh, actually uh, in a very negative way. What are the most performance critical areas, aerodynamic areas of a Formula One car at the moment? I mean, the front wing, the front wing and the front wing is probably what an aerodynamicist will tell you. The front wing sets the flow to the rest of the car, and it's also used to manage the, the front tyre wakes and where those tyre wakes hit the back of the car. In terms of where the most downforce is generated, it's the floor, and that floor is driven by the flow that we're pushing at the leading edge, which is controlled by the front wing and the barge boards, and it's driven by the diffuser we've got at the back. So I'd say heavy damage to the front wing, probably the, the bit that's the biggest hit, and then damage to the floor, probably second to that. Obviously, if you lose the whole of the rear wing, you're in fairly big trouble anyway. So I think in Lewis's case in, in Mexico, uh, uh, that area we would call the woovers that's in front of the, the rear tyres. So losing that loses some of the control of the flow that goes to the diffuser. It means that the floor doesn't perform as well. I can't remember off the top of my head what sort of a hit that would have been, but it probably would have been of the order of three or four tenths of that in downforce and then a bit more in balance. Well, something else that affects the performance of our cars is when we're following another. It's something that's talked about every single week, whether it's a race weekend or not. Why, why exactly are Formula One cars so hard? Uh, why is it so hard to follow another one through a corner? So we've talked about downforce and drag. Um, so one way of looking at drag is to look at the momentum in the flow behind the car. So as the, the car's going down the straight, because there's drag, it's actually dragging a chunk of air with it. So the car behind is actually not seeing the, the full airspeed of the car in front because the air is effectively moving away from it. So, so when we talk about the car behind, it sees a few things. It sees what we call this loss of dynamic pressure. The air is moving away from it to some extent. It also sort of sees some turbulence and it sees a chunk of upwash from the car in front. And that upwash changes the angle of incidence onto the elements of the car behind and that also loses downforce. So you've got those effects going on. But interestingly, the reason we're able to overtake on the straights is the same reason. The fact that you get a tow is because we've extracted energy out of the air from the car in front, and it's dragging that air with it, which means that the car behind has less drag. So although we lose out on the corners, we are to some extent gaining in the straights. I think in terms of the way we are with the current cars and the amount of downforce they're generating, the difficulty is following in the corners. Can you provide any, any sort of everyday examples of that and what that effect might feel like? Uh, is there anything that we'll experience on a day-to-day -day basis? It's a difficult one. I mean, I, I think everybody's probably stuck their hand out of the sunroof of a car and, or out the window of the car and they've felt what that dynamic pressure feels like when you try and hold your hand there. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of how the air is dragged along behind, um, probably the nearest thing I can think of is standing on the platform of a station when a high-speed train comes by. And you're, we've all sort of felt that as the train's coming from the right-hand side, we're sort of slowly pushed to our right. And then as it passes, we're sort of pulled behind it. I think that's probably the nearest 
thing we would experience to that. There's one final thing that I want to talk to you about. So effectively, you've told me that as um, we, we see that pressure differential on a, ring, on a wing, it's actually the bottom of the wing that's effectively generating more of the downforce, a negative pressure beneath the wing. So effectively, the car's being sucked to the ground. Yeah. Does this mean that aeroplanes, if the wings are inverted to an F1 car, as we say, is being sucked into the air? I think if you can make the statement that an F1 car is sucked to the ground, you make the statement that an aircraft is sucked up into the air. Certainly the, the pressure on the top side of the wing is a lot lower and therefore a bigger in magnitude than the positive pressure on the bottom side of the wings. More of the lift is coming from the upper surface of the wing. I don't know if that makes me feel better or worse about flying, the idea that I'm being sucked up into the air, um, but I appreciate your explanation. Thank you so much for, for simplifying uh, and myth busting um, some areas of aerodynamics. Uh, Mike Elliott, Technology Director at Mercedes-AMG Petronas Formula One team. Thanks so much for joining me. Thanks, Lee.